It's my pleasure to welcome today Dr. Anne Pollock. Anne is a tenured Wissenschaftliche Mitarbeiterin at the Johannes Gutenberg University of Mainz in Germany. She received her doctorate from the Martin Luther University Halle-Wittenberg in 2007. She taught as instructor at the USC. As she taught also at Stanford University and was a member of the Department of Philosophy at the University of South Carolina in Columbia for six years. She received tenure and was promoted to Associate Professor of Philosophy in 2019. And she, cho she chose to leave the US, so she came to us for Germany. So it's a big, a big win for us in Germany uh, to have Anne here. Everyone's very grateful for that. Um, her primary areas of research are early modern philosophy, aesthetics in the continental tradition, women in philosophy, and 20th century philosophy of culture. So her first book is titled Facetten des Menschen, so Moses Mendelssohn's Anthropologie. This is on Moses Mendelssohn's Anthropology, which she published with Minor in 2010. And for this work, she was awarded a prize of the Moses Mendelssohn Society of Dessau. Very, very prestigious stuff and, and great work that she has been doing on, on Mendelssohn. So she edited two books, so two works by Mendelssohn for Meiner Verlag, which is very prestigious in, in Germany. So his Fidon, a selection of texts on the vocation of man, as well as Mendelssohn's aesthetic, aesthetic writings. She also works on Ernst Cassirer's philosophy of symbolic forms and the expansion of this theory uh, through Susanne Langer, and is very interested in Cassirer's and Langer's approaches to intersubjectivity. So her recent projects right now focus on self-constitution and the authorship of women philosophers and poets, such as Bettina Berentano von Arnim, Dorothea Mendelssohn Weitschlegel, Rachel van Hahn, and others. So we are here going to hear about this recent work by Anne. So Anne, we would like to thank you very much for accepting our invitation. We know it's very hard for women right now to be able to be generous with their time during the pandemic. Everyone is struggling. Anne has children and she was uh, generous enough to devote uh, this time now to share her expertise with us. Anne, thank you very much. The floor is yours. <laughs> thank you so much, Alice. Um, thank you also for inviting me. And the first thing I need to say is please don't stop this series. Then take it over to Canada <laughs> and continue it there because um, it would be such a great thing to see this again. Um, I have this presentation for you and I hope I now manage to share it with all of you. Okay, just the, yeah. The last thing, no, it doesn't, doesn't work. Okay. Perfect. Can you see this? This is great. Okay, so um, at the title of my talk is, as you can see, The Art of Being Seen, Jewish Women and the Salon. Um, I'm in general very interested in this question, how women could become visible in any sort of or kind in the 18th and 19th century. And the Salon was one of these really prominent and interesting and very ambival ambivalent um, ways of be being able to be seen by others and also by oneself. And I find this, this issue interesting enough so that I spend a lot of time on that. Um, I, I wrote a paper on this uh, a year ago and I kept being interested in this here. So it's, it's kind of me going back and forth between these, these women and looking for all the clues that I needed to figure this out. Okay, um, my talk is very roughly, um, um, is, falls into three parts. The first is of course this question, what is the Salon at, as such? Um, what, am I, what am I talking about? What are these salient issues in, in the Salon regarding Jewish Saloniers? Um, so what is the issue that um, Jewish women in particular had in the Salon? 
why was it important for them and why was it also somewhat dangerous for them. And uh, then I want to focus on Rahel Farnhagen. Um, she is one of the first saloniers in Berlin. She is one of the most um, creative and intelligent ones and interesting ones. Um, when I when I was working on this, uh, I was just unsure why should I really focus on Rahel or should I focus on somebody else? Because there are other Jewish uh, saloniers who actually managed to stay Jewish. Um, and she is not among them, unfortunately. So, um, but then I decided, no, she is so interesting in the way in which she writes and in the way in which she combines um, being a salonier with being an author in the widest sense. And that's why I stuck to her. So as I said already, my overarching interest is to make these hidden voices visible that we hear throughout the 18th and 19th century. But we have been, we, we, we have been very, closed-minded for them. And I think in the last couple of years, this has become so much better. Okay, so we start with the negative. This is not a salon. Um, this is a so-called lese cabinet. Um, you see that there are very earnest men sitting there. Um, they are sitting for themselves and they are reading and they are having a very learned discussion. This is not what I together um, with uh, Petra Wilhelmi Dollinger, who wrote this really, really important book on the Salon. Um, so this is not what I take to be a Salon. This is another sort of social gathering that I'm actually not talking about. Um, I'm talking about the Salon in Germany in a particular time frame. Um, actually, the time frame is pretty small. It's, it's what, what I'm mostly interested in is the first phase of the Salon that spans roughly from 790 to 1806. Um, the historical roots of the Salon, of course, as you can hear in the word, are in France. Um, there are some Salons in Berlin and in Germany in, in, in um, general that are more modeled on the more formal kind of Salon that um, um, was, was en vogue in, 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 in France. Um, and, Interestingly enough, it is very late in the, in the days that um, women in Germany started to talk about their gatherings as a salon. Most of them talked about this being a circle, a little society, a, an open house. My Thursday, if it, it was the Thursday or any other day of the week, a Jew fix or a Teegesellschaft. Um, and important in here is that ideas of the Enlightenment um, were taken over and were tested out in these forms of little societies. Um, salons, in, in, per definition, center around a female hostess. Sometimes it is the case that a man is also there, but um, the hostess, the most, the, the, the focal point of the society is female. Um, a salon is not a club or a society or an association. Um, you have a standing invitation. Once you get invited into a salon, you are part of this and you can come whenever you want to. Mostly there's no fixed program. The, the, the tiny difference is between the salon and the musical salon, which had um, very elaborate programs. And for instance, um, Amalia Bea, the mother of uh, Giacomo Maya Bea, um, she had a very famous musical salon. And she's one of the few who never converted. So this, this should be noted. Um, so she had a program. Other salons um, normally didn't have them. And of course, you didn't pay a fee or anything else when you wanted to be there. Um, the membership in the salon is not dependent on social status. Um, so you didn't have to be part of the nobility to participate. You could even be Jewish in order to participate. That means you, you don't even have to be a citizen. Um, the salons have a high cultural attraction and influence um, due to the people who frequented the salon, of course. So you see the names, if you, if you see the list of the names of the people who were visiting or attending the salons, you see all the high society of Prussia, all those important people who played such a big role in reshaping Prussia to what it became in the middle of the, of the 19th century, they all attended the salons. And although a salon lacks an official or written protocol, it is not a bohemian kind of thing. It does not intend to break the art of social conduct, but it, it, it attempts to improve on the already existent 
um, um, means of social conduct. I will talk about Schleiermacher in, in a few minutes, so you'll hear more about that than you probably ever want to. Um, they, they, they don't have this, this rigid program. Nevertheless, it's not that easy to really lead in a, in a successful salon because you have to, I might, I might call this, you have to be able to create um, a feeling of spontaneity. And at the same time, you need to create this feeling that everybody is addressed, that everybody is important and that everybody has a voice. This requires quite a lot, as you can see in how Alice conducts this year. So um, not everybody can do this. And so the rules of the salon that were never written down is the negotiating of performance and authenticity. There's always this, this back and forth between these two poles and also the negotiation between the common and the foreign. So it had to appear that as if everything that happened in the salon is spontaneous and is free um, and it happens out of, uh, in, uh, in the moment of uh, whim of, 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 um, of an idea that you have. Um, but the, sal the salonier had to really take care that not some group drifted off to, to, the, to the corner and didn't, didn't participate in the discussion with the, other, with the other people. So that is what Bilski and Brown in their wonderful book on the power of conversation call this, the power of conversation. Um, this is also hard because you always already have to overcome differences, differences in religion, differences in gender, dif differences even in ethnicity. Um, and you should be, when you attend a salon, you have to, you should be a person. You have to come as this particular person that you are. Um, but of course, you should not overdo it. Otherwise, you cannot talk to anyone. So you have to be this particular person, but you also have to share your, your humanity with the group. So you have to remember that all of these other people are part of the same thing, of the same stuff. Um, and in this way, you always have to balance out. Um, being a particular person and also being part of a group. Um, as Bilski and Brown put it, you manage this with a certain stylized grace in order to make every, everybody feel at home and at the same time, everyone feel very excited about the things that are going on here. Um, there is something like a written document on how the salon is supposed to work. We have to say that um, we can we can we can expect that some people knew about this paper, but actually it's not an official um, a rule of conduct for the salon. It was this this the the, the towards the theory of social conduct this very short piece by Schleiermacher um, that was published in 1799, but actually fell into the dark abyss almost immediately and was re um, re, re um, was was what's the word. Um, it was found later, 100 years, 130 years later, um, and people then became aware that this is something that Schleiermacher read. They didn't know this yet. Um, and so now we all talk about as if everybody in this time knew about this paper, but I'm pretty sure some people knew, but others definitely didn't know about this. But it helps us a little bit to see um, what the, the theoretical background of understanding a salon could be. So it is about a free, I called it a conversation. I'm not quite sure if this is the best word. It's a, a free, it's, it's a version of a, a free conversation among rational human beings who are out there to educate each other. Um, and he puts it like that. Here, human beings are completely within the intellectual world and they can act as its rightful members. Being left to the free play of their powers, they can enhance them harmoniously and are subject to no law than the one they take upon by themselves. This sounds all wonderfully Kantian. It is just up to them to ban the limitations of both private and public circumstances for the time being. So in order to be in the salon, you actually have to establish a new kind of sphere that is in between the public sphere of your profession and the, the private sphere of your host household. Even though the salon takes place in a female household, it had to be something different than just being her private time. It's a little bit more than that. And here you see that um, what Schleiermacher and the Saloniers were, were hoping is that this would establish something like a free play between private and public, um, bet between your duties and your interests, between your um, in universal humanity and your individual interests. 
um, for this, you need a, a mutual interaction of the members. It's not that the salonier is educating the other people or that the other people are educating her, but it's a back and forth between all of them. There's, of course, then the need of a common ground that at least touches the individual circle of experiences of each member. Um, so what we should not have, and Schleiermacher discusses this in, in his piece in a quite nice form, what we should not have is a deep discussion of just one profession, but still um, everybody needs the opportunity to contribute from one's individual standpoint. So we need to move away from public issues or of specific public professions, but we actually have to come to terms um, with each other by finding topics that are a way that it move away from this. And what better topics could there be if not music and literature and maybe the sciences? So he also mentions, of course, this dilemma. If I should bring my character, my individual into these circles, I should also adapt to the common character of these circles. And if I'm just following the common conduct of everyone, then I don't have anything of interest to contribute to this. Um, Schleiermach tries to circumvent this in that he says, okay, um, the individual aspect in reference to society, the individual that I bring in is the form, is the manner in which I conduct myself, and the character of the society is due to its topics, or the Stoff, as he uh, calls it, and this is the tone of the society. Um, this is really hard to actually um, follow because you would say, well, in a certain way, a tone and a manner of speaking is quite similar. Um, but what he wanted to say here, I guess, is that you have to have a certain topic that you share, but the way in which you um, judge this topic, that can be different, and in the way in which you talk about this topic can also be different. No one should shy away from being in their element, so we have to have a recognition of a shared room for agency of a common ground, but the individual manners of expression of, uh, can be different, and all of this amounts to a mutual education of these people. He also said that women are naturally well-fitted leaders of such groups, as for them, private and public falls into one. They, they, they do not really distinguish between these two because they don't have a public uh, profession, um, but they, they bring what they have into this realm of the intermediate between private and, and, and public. They connect with the others not through their profession, but they connect to the others through their shared status of educated, being an educated and being a, an educated, well-formed human being. Um, in, in German, this is easier to, to put. You would just say being a gebildeter Mensch. Um, Bildung for me um, um, includes being educated on the one hand, but also being well-formed as a human being on the other. Um, and in the process of finding a sociability that is proper, uh, one, this also supports individual growth as well as um, the formation of a proper social group. So in this way, um, he promotes the, the new by aligning it with the old. And that's why I said before, it is not a bohemian thing, but it, it's something different. Um, but the view on the Salon, um, from our times, but also in, 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 um, from by contemporaries, mostly in our times, is that there is a certain tension that we have when we start talking about the Salon. So there is um, a definite trend in saying the Salon must be a, just a wonderful thing. It is egalitarian, everybody is allowed to participate, it's much more open than other societies, it's cut, it cuts across classes and it offers a reprieve from professionalism and from uh, common morality. So in this way, it would um, contribute to a democratization of culture. And that would be just a wonderful form of a new kind of society, a more free society that we could have. It would also allow for new forms of social mobility of Jewish women. They could interact with, with other people. They could find a partner. Um, they can exercise their creativity and guide a discussion, which is a, a completely new thing that the, the woman would be the natural guide, uh, gu guide in, these, in these kinds of situations. At the same time, um, people warn that we shouldn't overestimate the salon. Um, here I put it like they are dangerous. Well, they're not dangerous, but maybe they are overrated. So um, on the one hand, social mobility is a good thing. But on the other hand, in 18th, 19th century Germany, 
social mobility oftentimes meant um, assimilation and that would be like an extinction of Jewish culture because you would not put forward your Jewishness in there, but you would put forward your common humanity. And um, it, it went so far as that many people were denying um, that being Jewish meant anything in particular. And so it kind of evened out the field, but then you, you would not have, you would not preserve um, any specific rituals, um, but everybody would become this, this whole rounded human being without um, this individual context. Um, the other thing is that um, Jewish male intellectual had a much harder time getting into this, these societies and being accepted as what they are than the women had. Um, and this, this, of course, also shows in, in, in retrospect that, that people said, OK, women can adapt pretty much better because there are nothing. <laughs> um, and so they are just adaptive. This, this is, of course, is a, is a very, very crass view. But, but it, there is some truth in this, as um, in those societies, um, male Jewish intellectual did have a harder time than the women. And what we know of the Salon is very little in terms of actual um, 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 material because nobody sat in these Salons and would, and would write everything down that was said. Most of the um, accounts on Salon life came after the Salon actually, this kind of Salon actually um, died out. So some of this is either due to a personal interest of self-representation, how you would describe the Salon and your role in it. Um, it could also be because of political interest or nostalgia. So what we have about the Salon is to be read with a certain uh, caution in mind. That's, that's what I wanted to say with this. Um, I think I myself, I'm more on the positive side. <laughs> So uh, that I say, the Salon is actually a good place, it has been a good place for women to learn how to present themselves and then also how to see themselves. This is, would be a kind of a hermeneutical, hermeneutical issue of female self-understanding that the Salon helped them to find a role or at least to witness another person, another woman in this role. Um, and so what I, what I would want to say is that the female identity that we see there as developed through the Salon is complex, imaginative, and fundamentally dialogical. You might hear um, my interest in intersubjectivity shine through. So it's complex um, because it, it asks for different methods of self-exploration, expression, and formation. Um, and that is reflected in different genres for the reconstruction. You see um, kind of the, 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 the shadow of the Salon in letters. You see the shadow of the Salon in um, 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 diary entries and in memories, all of these things that were written down um, and there the Salon helped the women to express themselves more fully. They are imaginative, this, this, this female identity finding is imaginative um, because you need to, do, to form an artful narrative and it, the assessment contributes to our image of the individual, the Salonier, the woman and the Salon. So you have to um, really look behind the, the picture that you see, the images that you see, and also the text that you see um, in order to find um, the ways of self-presentation that these women found in order to be a successful salonier. And of course, this is dialogical because the saloniers and all the women develop their persona through interaction, maybe in the salon, in the letters, in the diaries, et cetera. So, most likely what we discover, the people that we discover are for the time being no real people, of course, but they are a net of stage perceptions and designs. But this helped, um, it helps for us in retrospect to create the persona of the Salonier, but it helped them as well to create themselves in light of what the other people saw, saw them as. Okay, with that, I actually already put quite some stuff out there, what the salient issues are in the Salon. So the one thing is for all of these receptions in general is that women are rarely visible in discourse. So you see a lot of women, um, um, some, some of these women would publish something. Some of them would even add their name to the publication. Most of them wouldn't, would either use a pseudonym or something else, um, or they would just write for themselves or talk for, with, with other women and would not uh, put that out there. 
Um, so how do we make this, this, this salon visible? As I said before, you take literary um, 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 traces that, that we can have like letters, like um, 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 mem memoirs where people wrote down what they, what they, what they have seen and how they want to be seen as that. Um, you have all of these and you know that self-fashioning is, is kind of a very important aspect in there. The Jews or the Jewish elite of that time um, is in this, in this sense playing the role of a social arbiter and a cultural catalyst. So those, those Jews that, that I'm going to talk about are of course not the majority of, of the, the Jewish population, not even in Berlin of course. Um, most of the Jews in that time didn't have the right to citizenship at all. Well, all of them didn't have the right to citizenship at all. What they could become would be a, a so-called Schutzjude, so a safe, safe Jew or a Jew under, under the guard, guardianship of another person. Um, and these Jews were needed in the Prussian state in order to keep the state afloat. So that those were the only ones that could actually gain some access to the society and that were um, seen and heard. Um, most of the other ones um, were not were not really visible in this in these kinds of conversations. But these people were extremely important for the society, the Prussian society overall. So um, as Ben Habib says so wonderfully, um, if we ask the woman's question. Always, it signifies a movement from center to margin in the hermeneutical task. And that was what I was saying before. When we asked the, the question, what is the female role? What is, what is the female persona in the 18th and 19th century? We have to move from the center of discussions to the, towards the margins in order to actually see what is going on. Um, they were mostly limited to the domestic sphere, sphere and thus there are not many documents to go by. Um, if they had some sort of training, it was mostly not academic. So it, it excludes definitely Latin, the classics and the sciences. Um, and so most of the documents that, that uh, we, we have from them is mostly fictional and or personal. So we, we have some, some um, um, academic treatises, but they are far and in between. Um, they had very limited rights and possessions. Um, and presenting themselves as a public persona had its risks. So most of the time, if a woman in that time would present herself as a self-standing intellectual, she would have really trouble um, finding a husband. And that means she would have trouble establishing a real household. That was quite something to, to consider for these women um, because they, they would, they, they would lo lose a lot if they would stand out too much. So, and, and you see this in most of these publications, they um, have this captatio benevolentiae at the very beginning where they say, I didn't actually want to publish this. Um, I was asked to by some man who said, I would, I would do a good job for other women so that they could look at this. Um, and so most of the time, the, the urge is not to stand out and not to be seen. And this is, of course, something that is rather different to those saloniers that we are going to encounter. Nevertheless, there, there are some women who are very outspoken about the importance of female education and also female representation. One of these women is Amalia Holtz, and she writes in on the vocation of the women um, towards a higher intellectual education. Since women's influence so powerfully determines the driving forces of human happiness, the education of women is the, of the utmost importance. In the higher intellectual education and self-formation of women, all of humanity is also educated and formed since their influence exerts not only on the early education of humankind, not only influences the driving forces of, forces of the machine of the state, but it also has a powerful influence on social discourse. Just look around in smaller and bigger cities, just take note of the tone in the societies there and you will be able to abstract the moral and intellectual education of women from it. The kingdom of the ethically beautiful is our realm. And if this realm is improved, then the whole of humanity is of course also improved. Um, I find it in particularly interesting that she mentions here the early education of humankind, which by law was um, the, the duty of women, of women. 
um, but also then jumps immediately to the driving forces of the machine of the state, which the woman obviously also influenced by bringing up all these children. Um, but then she finds the most powerful thing, the influence on social discourse. Good. Um, so now we crank it up a little bit and say, being a woman is hard in Prussia in that time. Being a Jewish woman is even harder. Um, they suffered under isolation, ignorance, and persecution, and they had to use wit, negotiation, and improvisation as survival skills. That, that's, that's clear. Um, for them, it was hard to be a woman on the street and a Jew at home, as, as some said men tried to, to um, manage their, their being a Jew and being uh, at the same time a professional. Um, so she couldn't do this. She couldn't, she couldn't make this kind of distinction because there was no real distinction for them between street and home. Um, there is, of course, a high value of intellectual life in Jewish culture and a value of dialogue and debate. Um, and we just see this in the Talmudic tradition of hermeneutic interpretation. The, the issue is just, and this, you find different sources on that. Um, so the issue is that it's is, is just that women didn't have direct access to this. So um, in Berlin at this time, when, the, when a, 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 high, a, a family with a high income and with important connections, a Jewish family of as that, um, when they educated their kids, um, they, they paid a lot of attention to the education, but it was rather more a secular um, um, education in this, in this way. Um, and even there, it was not as um, um, sophisticated an education for women as it was for the men. Um, in general, we can say um, that the education for Jewish women was better than for Gentile women. Um, there was much more um, focus on, for example, literature. There was much, much, much more focus on, on the issues that, that come up in, in discussion and dialogue. But it's, it's, it's still not that they would be prepared for an academic um, education in any way. Being a well-educated woman in this time is also kind of like a streak of luck. If you have the right parents, then they might take enough time to educate you in this way. They, are not, they don't have to educate you in this way. And if you are lucky enough to have those parents who pay attention to you and to actually who actually guide you through all of this, then it could also be a curse because you would then constantly be um, under um, under um, challenged by 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 the life that you are set up for. So on the one hand, it is it is um, a streak of luck if you get a good education, and the other hand, it can be a curse for you. Um, by holding a salon, you those women gained access to society by a personal association with the upper class and the intelligence. That was, of course, really, really important for them. Um, and you see that these social opportunities that were opened up by the Salon account for the growing number of converting Jewish women. That was a, a big thing in, um, at the end of the 18th century, in particular in Prussia and in, in Berlin. Why was the Jewish Salon so much more attractive than anything led by Gentiles, we don't quite know. Here we have one um, um, memory of Henriette Herz about this. Um, the Christian houses of Berlin could not offer anything which would even come close to, or be at least similar to what Jewish houses could offer in intellectual sociability. Back then, learned men existed, <laughs> even though Berlin would not yet get a university until some 30 or 40 years later. But these men preferred, after they had dedicated the better part of their day to their studies or business, to stay within their closer family or to meet each other at some public space, a place where they discussed very seriously and very pedantically, think back to the picture, the second picture that I gave you, scientific topics accompanied by a glass of beer, that would be very German. Their wives would have felt like they curtailed their qualities as a good and dignified housewife had they given any room to their intellectual interests. Also, this would have become a nuisance for their husbands. Yes, it would have even seemed like a profanation of their sanctuary of science. Little by little, everybody of any importance among the young men living or visiting Berlin had been sucked into the circle as if by a spell. And with this circle, we mean the, the, the salons of the Jewish saloniers. Self-confidence and youth did not suffer that at once established light 
should be hid under a bushel. And so it already shines into further distances. That means attracts people from even further out. Female companions and female friends of those young men eventually joined the fund. Soon after, free-thinking, more matured men followed suit after word of such sociability reached their circles. Even foreign diplomats did not spurn us. So you see, um, those circles were of immense attraction to, to um, people. And it was that these Jewish women did not feel that they, as, as, as we have it in the quote before, they, they did not feel that they would uh, be curtailed by, by uh, paying attention to their, in, to their intellectual interests. And also their husbands, most of the time, would be very supportive of their, um, their intellectual pursuits. In the background, you see um, a wonderful portrait of Henriette Herz shortly before she married. Um, and Markus Herz, her husband, who was 19 years as senior, is quite a good example of that, who never bat an eye at um, his wife's intellectual interests, quite the opposite. He helped her to develop these interests. He uh, introduced her to Goethe. And so um, he is in the end responsible for the Jewish Salon also to become the place of um, Goethe veneration that we know of. Okay. As I said before, um, I'm interested in these, in these voices of, uh, of, of, of women in those times also because they are so hidden and so unheard. So why does the Salon has not a deeper impact if it was so important at the, at the time being? Um, there are some hints in there. So one, one is that um, if you look at letters from the early 19th century of some of those people who attended the Salon, like Wilhelm von Humboldt, for example, then you see that these people, the Germans, the, the, the Christian Germans, were still quite unwilling to change old thinking patterns. So they would still refer to the salons led by Jewish uh, saloniers as the Israelite salon or um, something in some derogatory language. So it was, it, was, it was still clear that the Jewish salonier was the other. And if you want to do something properly, you can, you can, get, there, you can get there and talk and, and have, have fun. But if you really want to do something serious, then you move out and you do something else. Um, then, of course, a very, very dry kind of topic, but the political developments after 1806, when they lost in Jena and Auerstedt, um, so which led to a demise, a short demise of the, of the Prussian state, and then they had to kind of rework their way up. Um, end of 1812 provoked resistance against assimilation. So from both sides, you see that people were became unwilling to take it any further. Um, with 1812, I mean the Edict of Tolerance, um, and there would you see that Jew Jewish, um, the Jewish uh, people became the right to citizenship. And at the same time, this provoked people to kind of distinguish themselves more from um, the Jewish citizens than, than we would have thought possible. Um, you can also see that quite some women themselves were not quite happy with the Jewish salons and tries to try to mark them as something that is out of the ordinary and shouldn't be shouldn't be um, um, the common ground for all of us. Um, I just have this this quote for you from uh, Friederike, Friederike von Ungers uh, novel Jürgen Grüntal. The fashionable world expressed its tolerance mostly by tolerating the well-garnished table and cellar of the rich Jewish houses. The younger and gallant part of it sought association with Romans-like and eccentric, eccentric Israelites, partly out of financial speculation, partly so that they could give proofs of their bright thinking without having to jog their brains. Um, so here you see the typical allusions to um, the well-garnished table and cellar of the rich, that they were so rich is of course worthy of being pointed out. Um, and um, so people just pretended to pretended to accept these uh, the Jews in that they used what the seller and the table had to offer. And they could play being intelligent without really having to work for it. Um, so for quite some people, the Jewish salon was perceived as a threat. And on the other hand, then from the Jews, um, they had to the pressure to appear unassuming. Um, in general, we can say um, there are different um, 
trends or, or traditions of the Salon, the Salon that I'm talking about is, is unfortunately rather witnessing a further and further assimilation of the Jews and not the bold self-fashioning as the other, which is um, rather, rather interesting in the later part of the 19th century and not necessarily in Berlin. In terms of time, I do, do not want to go through all of this. I mentioned some of this. Um, those are um, historical dates and historical uh, circumstances that are important um, for um, this time being um, a rather fruitful time for, for trying out ways of Jewish and Christian interaction, but at the same time, we're also a hindrance for that. Um, maybe we can talk in the discussion part about this. Um, it might be, of course, also interesting that in, in, the, in the time where the Salon was really at its heights, um, you have a lot of anti-Semitic uh, voices that begrudgingly have to say, yeah, these, these women were intelligent and they were good and they were interesting. I'm talking about the latter part of, of this, 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 um, this um, part. Um, but, you know, they cannot be quite that good because they are not able to unite all these elements into a total attractive femininity. So they have to say something about the Jews being able to pick things up, but they couldn't synthesize them into one, um, um, in one um, convincing whole. Um, I'm not taking that seriously. I'm just mentioning it. Um, it is quite important to notice that there were lots of saloniers who were Jewish who were leading these salons and quite next to all of them at some point um, converted to Christianity. Um, Henriette Herz and Karl Levin Farnhagen represent two quite two extremes on a wide spectrum in terms of when they married and, and um, uh, what happened to them. Herz married very early with an extreme age gap, I mentioned 19 years. Levin married very late and a Gentile who was later made a nobleman. Um, both of them dealt with their fates in a very similar way in that they established a salon in a way to express themselves. And that brings me to that last part um, where I want to uh, focus on, and that is um, I live in Farnhagen. And I start from the very end, kind of the end, with Hannah Arendt's um, book, Rael, the Life of a Jewish, uh, Jewess, in, 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 published in 1957. It's very interesting. Hannah Arendt started this book in 1938, um, and she's not interested in, in forming a national identity by instantiating a heroine, quite the opposite. She wants to, to tell us the story as Rael might have told it, so guided by introspection. introspection. Um, and she shows us a protagonist. And I think if you look into um, the, the, the letters that, that uh, Raal and, and her husband published later on, um, you might see a person who is being concerned about authenticity, personhood, self-knowledge, and self-possession. Um, Hannah Arendt propositions that for her, Jewishness is an existential condition. This is what Jaspers criticized in, in her work, but she stuck to it. And he said, yeah, the, the problem is that with being with being Jewish, with being Jewish comes a certain kind of faithfulness and that you are fundamentally different from your surroundings. And that brings with it also a certain kind of worldlessness because you, are, you have no accepted sphere of being if you want to be um, or count as somebody in the culture that you are with. Um, then you have to give up on your roots. If you are, want to stick to your roots, then the culture that you are with will not is not going to accept you. Arendt's overall interest is a portraiture of failure of Jewish assimilation in Germany, that you are forced into a dilemmatic choice between being an outcast or an imposter. Before I go further in that, um, just quickly, this is a very common problem when you talk about any um, woman and also in particular a Jewish woman in the 18th and 19th century, um, that you have to do with quite a lot of different names and you have to know which names belong together. Um, so the person I'm talking about is Rahel Antony Friederike Farnhagen von Ense. That was her name after 1814, after she married. When she was born, it's the name Rahel Levin that is important that she turned into the name of Rahel Robert when she converted and then it became um, 
Friederike von en van Hagen von Ense. She signed the letters with different um, acronyms. And the way she, she is known um, today is just her first name, Rai, and nothing else. The other dates are just there for, for historical correctness. Um, so I can go back to them if there's any need. So coming back to the dilemma that I was talking about. So she could either choose to be an actor, part of an upcoming social group who does not need a pedigree, but must live up to the expectation, can, can create new roles, but must fill them out on her own and in contradistinction to her past, her origin and her authenticity. Or she could be the outcast. She could stay true to herself, but then she had to be on her own and not within the society that she wanted. Being an outcast was not an option for Rai van Hagen, um, who thrived on social contact and exchange. But being an actor proved to be not ideal either, because you see that in her letters that she constantly um, um, fought with this, with this notion of just being a person who pretended to be somebody who, whom she was not. My continual pretending, my reasonability, my single conceding, which I am no longer even conscious of, and my acceptance eat me up. I cannot do it any longer and nothing, nobody can help me, she complains once to Simon Feit, a friend of hers. Um, and this complaint you can hear in her letters time and again. Um, and in, in, for, for a large part, she makes her Jewishness um, to be uh, um, responsible of that. Uh, to her friend Froberg, she says, God, must I eternally clear away rubble that others leave me? How horrid is it to always have to legitimate yourself? That's why it is so hateful to be a Jewish. And she um, describes her whole life as uh, bleeding to death. So she feels down by the prejudices and the exclusions of the society. Um, and the, the person that she feels she is, and that is might be part of also being a female Jew, is clashing with the construction of a persona that she has to conduct in order to stay afloat in the society that she is um, confronted with. Um, her salon, I think, is a means to display what she wanted to be rather than showing what she had. Um, she is in that without a past, without a close narrative, but in charge of creating connections and new narratives. Um, and this counts in particular for the first salon, the so-called Dachstube, which um, connected really a, a very interesting array of people from the highest tiers of political professionalism um, and literally the, the literary world and, and everybody. Um, and she was allowed to talk to them freely and also sometimes to scold them. Um, when she calls them, uh, when she tells them her Dachstubenwahrheiten, the truth of the, the attic. Um, so it's egalitarian, truthful, and respectful. The other is a human being, it's not representing a class, a gender, or religion. Um, she herself is, in a certain way, extraordinary. She's also the first not married woman to have a salon. So she's not too beautiful, she's not too wealthy, she's not too connected. Um, and she's really singular as being a most intellectual sudden year. And she, as I said before, the, the trouble of standing for herself, she turns into a, her own kind of agency. Um, she conducts those salons. Uh, she is very active in these salons. She summarizes the statements of the participants. She turns them into aphorisms. Um, and she turns them into, into something that these people can take back with them. Um, you have lots of these statements that say, oh, I was at her salon today and I, I, I have this feeling that I, I'm taking something home with me that I wasn't aware before. Um, and so she uses this taking a hold of herself as a weapon against disappointment, which she had a lot of, um, or negation. And so she, she talk, um, told her former fiancé who um, decided rather not to marry the little Jew, but to marry um, another noble woman. You can no longer pursue me. Be something, and I shall recognize you. In a way, um, I, would, I would then agree with, with uh, Arendt that uh, she had the, the choice of being either the paria or the parvenu, um, but she chose to be conscious, a conscious paria and a conscious parvenu at the same time. Um, she gathers strength from marginality, she scoffs as conformism, she demands equality under the law and builds herself on her own terms, is what Hobbilski and Brown put this. And this is why um, it's just her name and not any other kind of, of um, um, connection that it may, is made with her and with her, her fame. Um, 
And she's also the conscious Pavani in, the, in that she does indeed climb the social ladder. She marries, she converts, um, and she uh, surrounds herself by all kinds of guests with, and did not care about her acceptance within the strictly Jewish community. Um, when, she, when she converts, um, she also starts reading the Bible. We have quite some, some letters where she talks about that. And you have this impression that she takes this on as another role that she has to play. Um, where she is interested in the in the large and in the in the in the um, um, effectful narratives um, of the New Testament, but she she is she's not she doesn't sound like a devout person in any by any ways by any means. Um, and for this for this she tries to find a new language, and I find it interesting that she actually doesn't talk about a language, but she equates language with life. And this language or this life that she is referring to is some form of a dialogue or a conversation, how they actually take place among people full of life. And she says then, and this is why she does this, uh, because she says she has language not as her at her perfect command, not even German, my own. Our language is our lived life. I have invented my own, therefore I could make less use of many others of existing phrases. That is why mine are often rough and flawed in all sorts of ways, but they are always genuine. And she needs this, this life, this dialogue with others in order to actually feel herself and be something. When she had to um, close her first salon in 1806, um, we have tons of letters where she bemoans this, this, this situation that she's in and that nobody is visiting her anymore. She feels like, like nothing. Um, and she constantly tells her, 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 um, her partners in dialogue, whom she exchanges these letter, letters with, um, if she loses them, she, then she's going to lose an important part of her. So you see that she brings herself forward in these discussions with these other people, and she feels like she is the person that she is only if she has if she, if she stays in this exchange um, with these other people. And together with her husband, uh, who is fourteen years her junior, uh, she established establishes her living monument, a living script that is ultimately a collective intellectual production, as Barbara Hahn puts it so elaborately. Um, so this is the book, a book of commemoration for her friends that first appeared in 1833 and had several um, new editions and got longer and bigger as time goes on. Um, and this is actually still a process where uh, still new letters are found and are put in there. So she continues and heightens her, her life herself in this being in letters. Um, and this is a new status that she um, develops for herself, which is a status in between being accepted as a Christian, being accepted as a Jew, but she's just Raal. It is a name that evokes um, um, Jewish association, but at the same time, she says, I'm standing for myself and I don't, don't need any, any backdrop in either of the, these traditions. The greatest artist, philosopher, or poet is not above me. We are all from the same element. We are in the same class, we belong together, and whoever wants to exclude the other just ends up excluding oneself. And so in the end, um, she um, sums up her life um, as this. When I must die, I do think she knew everything because everything was familiar to her. She never, she was never anything, aimed for nothing, and filtered everything through her mind and brought it into a general context. She grasped Fichte, which is such a feat, loved green things, children, understood the arts, humanity's helpmate. She wanted to help God and his creatures, always uninterruptedly, and thanked him for this, her disposition. So in the very end, she, she developed a character that is conscious of the inner tensions that she was in, that is at the same time expressive and inclusive of all of these tensions and differences. And this um, is a new kind of woman as a task in that she is an active part of the society, but this activity is not a profession, but it's this self-conscious development of a dialogue with others. So to get to some sort of results from my thoughts that I tried to bring to you, to your attention today. Um, 
what Ralf Anhagen does is that she uses intellectual and artistic means for self-formation through and with the other. Um, being oneself is a means of self-representation so that she had to kind of create that stage that she could use in order to see herself and be seen by others. Um, she, with that, she, she is part of this change in traditions of talking, writing, and reflecting. And the basis in the Salon is, is always a common enthusiasm for something. Sometimes it's good to something, sometimes it's something else. Um, there's a common conduct and they have a shared experience or a shared um, platform for experiences and styles of conduct. Um, this gives a new form of a narrative, and the constitutive part of this narrative is the dialogue, the general openness for the other and an open-endedness of this dialogue. It could go on forever and we could find new letters and they could be um, 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 taken forth by, by other people. It would still be a form of a narrative that is kind of carried forth by these letters. Um, so in a way, this, this self-expression through, through the, the back and forth in these letters and the revision of, of one's own view in, in the next letter, being caught up in between oneself and the audience, and always gives a certain tension in the, in the concept of the authenticity that, that Ralf Hanhang represents. Um, it doesn't have to be a tragic dilemma. I'm, I'm still actually uh, quite openly not, not sure if it is in the end this, this dilemma or not. If a difference can and should be upheld. Um, and this would be then the, the big question of assimilation. What, what, what Rahel shows is that um, you can live in the, the, um, in the tension of being part of different groups and these groups being not very well um, in, in fusing together. Um, but on the other hand, she did um, not really care for um, for her her for the tradition that she was born in, she felt uprooted when she had to convert. Um, but on the other hand, it didn't seem to go as deep as that she would that she would be willing um, to keep um, the essential parts of Judaism alive. She did not do that. Um, the other result that I that I was uh, referring to earlier is that the consequences of the salon as such had were next to nothing. Um, the politics and habits stayed stubbornly in place and the restorative tendencies of Prussia in the 1830s, 1840s grew even stronger and would overtake any positive influence that this salon um, had at any point in time. So um, our danger of understanding the salon once again is that we kind of start to um, painted in a, in, a, in a color that it never actually had. And this is what, um, when, when, I, when I read this, 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 this passage that I had here as a last quote for you, that I was reminded of when I thought the Salon really did help um, characters like Karl van Hagen to, to bring these, these inner tension um, between being a self and being a self in a, within a certain community and being a self within, within a new upcoming community to the fore. And it should have made all of these women more visible. But um, then you see how people look back um, to the Salon, to the, these early Salons. And what you see is that um, most of this, these women that participated in the Salons and that also were leaders of the Salon kind of were reverted back into the shadows in the, the, the memory of these other people. So here in the, in the passage that I, that I had here, um, Hitze Fleece, who is now the Countess of Sparre, brought to Brinkmann, who is um, a, a Swedish diplomat and it's already back in his home country. And she remembers um, the, the Salon of Rahel Farnhagen. And of course, when you, when you remember something um, that you that you experienced and um, the, the the motor of this of this um, experience that you have is already dead, um, then you tend to paint this in in a in a rather um, nostalgic and 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 pretty pretty way. Um, but then she says, "Dear Brinkmann, I have to move you, otherwise I cannot read this." Dear Brinkmann, the sacred evenings where you, Gens, Humboldt, and his wife, not mentioned, 
Prince Louis, Louis Ferdinand of Prussia, and whoever else surrounding the wonderful person was there. And the, what dear women, even the shadows that appeared there were not without interest. So even here in the memory, in the, in the remembrance of a woman um, on the Salon by um, Ralph Farnhagen, the other women remain unnamed and remain to be shadows that nobody quite remembers. Um, nowadays, we have a lot of names and we can connect these names um, to these specific salons that were there, but it's still quite a lot of work to bring this back to our consciousness um, that there were these active women reflecting themselves and forming themselves in dialogue with others and who had actually quite a big impact on um, the further development um, of the state and of um, um, those intellectual trends, but you could not really and quite see them because they were shining forth for a tiny little while and then they were kind of moved back into the shadow. And it's our, our task, I think, to kind of lighten up the, the, this, this, um, this tableau and look at it time and again in order to see them better. Okay, thank you.